Hello, I'm Omar Mubarak. I'm uh, one of the vascular surgeons at Vascular Institute of the Rockies. Um, I've actually gotten in trouble a lot for just seeing a, a random person in the gym or at the mall and being like, I could fix that, just, just so you know. Um, and my wife yelled at me for it. So I'm gonna discuss venous insufficiency, um, but really this does look at all aspects of leg swelling. And you'll see as we go through that it, it really shows you kind of all the treatment options and the many things that are going on. This was actually not a very popular thing for vascular surgeons maybe 10 years ago. You'd get all these patients who were referred to you for leg swelling and we weren't as excited, but nowadays actually there are so many different modalities of things we can do. And just to put it in perspective, venous disease dwarfs arterial disease by 11 to one. So while we do like to take care of arterial disease, and it's actually one of my favorite things, there are way more venous patients out there. So <clears throat> typically the wounds kind of also define what a person has. If you look, there is a wound at the tip of the toes that tends, tends to be more arterial related because it's the furthest point away from the pump. But venous disease tends to occur in the lower third of the leg in the gator region. And that's because the veins are trying to send the blood back up. And that's where a lot of perforators lie. And, and the largest number of valves is in the lower part of the leg. So <clears throat> venous disease isn't usually going to lead to an amputation. What it does is it's chronic, exactly the way uh, that patient had described. It's leg swelling wounds. And, it, and it's kind of, it is very debilitating all, all on its own, but it isn't going to lead to an acute amputation usually. Uh, again, an estimated 25 million people would have symptomatic uh, venous insufficiency and reflux. So it, it dwarfs arterial disease. And yet only 1.7 million seek treatment annually. Uh, usually it affects women more than men. And the, ol the older you get, sadly, the more likely you are to have the valves break down and end up with venous disease. So, and that's what the pathology is, is you have um, a redundancy of the venous system as opposed to the arterial system. So there are deep veins that are inside the muscle. And then there are several superficial veins. And the two main ones are the great saphenous vein right here and the lesser saphenous vein. The greater saphenous vein travels on the medial part of your thigh down your leg, the lesser on the back of your leg. And when the valves break, the blood goes in the wrong direction and it collects. Similarly, the deep system, the valves can break and lead to blood going in the wrong direction, but at least you have the musculature pumping against it. So when you're active and you walk and you run, it acts like the calf muscle pump. It essentially acts like your heart to shoot the blood back. In the superficial venous system, there is no such pump to, to force the blood back. And so it, it collects. What they believe actually happens in the superficial system to at least augment blood flow is your breathing. When you exhale, you create a negative pressure in the chest. It acts like a man sucking on a straw to pull the blood up. When you inhale, it would shoot the blood back down, but the valves should stop the blood from going back down. When they're broken, it won't, and so the blood pools. This is the SEEP classification. I won't go through it in detail, but it kind of shows you the spectrum of venous disease, starting at C0, all the way to like telangiectasias, varicose veins, venous stasis disease, and then finally just frank open ulcers. The reason I put up this slide about iliac crossing syndrome is exactly what I was trying to get up or get to in, the, in that presentation earlier. There are other things that can go on in the venous system and you need to evaluate them. And I do think seeing a vascular surgeon has a huge benefit because the vascular surgeon is thinking about all of them. I, I assume somebody else is going to talk about iliac crossing syndrome, but I will mention it. You can end up having an artery going across the veins or some form of compression in the abdomen and the blood flow isn't coming back in the pelvis. And the reason that's significant is, is even if you were to take care of some varicose veins on the person, if they have venous insufficiency and they have iliac crossing syndrome, you still have to take care of the iliac crossing syndrome or they're going to experience chronic leg swelling. Similarly, there's another pathology, pelvic congestion syndrome, 
in which the ovarian veins are broken, they allow blood to go in the wrong direction. And when that occurs, a person can literally present with what are thigh varicosities. And commonly, you know, a, a doc might just think, oh, those are just varicose veins, but really the origin was inside of the abdomen. So you have to be aware of these different pathologies along with whether the patient had chronic DVT, um, and there are all, several other pathologies that can just lead to leg swelling. Here's a patient with pelvic uh, congestion syndrome, and you can see the varicosities in the thigh, how easily somebody might just say, oh, well, they're just varicose veins in the thigh, but the pathology is actually more central. <clears throat> the risk factors for venous disease include genetics, occupations where you stand all day long, pregnancy, a history of DVT, obesity, and trauma. And we've had patients who will say things like, all I did was get hit playing football, and all of a sudden I started to form varicose veins. The symptoms of venous insufficiency range from spider veins and leg swelling to open wounds and um, venous stasis deposition. So usually when we have one of these patients, we'll do a thorough h &P to try and determine if there's anything else that might be going on or contributing to leg swelling or problem. But the venous duplex is probably the most key item in evaluating them. And at VIR, we have uh, you know, one of the best iCable, if not the best iCable lab for several states. And what they will do is not only rule out a DVT, but they'll go through and look at insufficiency in the greater and lesser saphenous vein. They'll evaluate for iliac crossing syndrome, and they'll also evaluate for pelvic congestion syndrome. So really they're looking at, at multiple reasons as to why you may actually have the leg swelling and problem that you have. There really isn't imaging for lymphedema, if anybody is thinking about that too. Um, and in our h &P, we would have hopefully caught whether the patient had some form of congestive heart failure or something that was also triggering leg swelling. And this is a typical ultrasound report that you would get at VIR that would look at both the deep and superficial systems, look for iliac crossing syndrome and ovarian uh, insufficiency, ovarian vein insufficiency. So the treatment <clears throat> for the patient with leg swelling, I, I, I don't want to just jump straight to like the operative things that we would do, but go through like what typically should happen. We uh, but I, I literally call it, and I tell the patients this, we're throwing the kitchen sink at your, at your lower extremity. We are going to evaluate you for lymphedema, venous insufficiency, history of DVT. Do you have congestive heart failure? What are all the possible problems that you might have? We, a mainstay is obviously compression therapy. That's like the, the beginning. Most insurances will not let you even move to a procedure unless the patient has had compression therapy for three months. There, there is a wide range of compression therapy. So if you're, if you're you know, under the age of 65, it's very easy for you likely to get on compression stockings, 20 to 30 millimeter mercury compression stockings. But in the older population, they just simply can't. Some of them will tell you, I can't even bend over to put these on, they're so hard, I'm gonna hurt my back while trying to get on this sock. So we have circades, which are a Velcro kind of stocking, and I'm gonna show you pictures of all this. We have Jopes pumps, which would help with lymphedema. And honestly, in a person who's had like chronic DVT, it can also help them to gain control of their leg swelling. And then daily exercise. I listed a, you know, sclerotherapy as question mark. Is it purely cosmetic? I would argue that it is in most people, but there are definitely lots of people in their 70s, 80s who will tell you that they've gone to the ER twice for a bleed from a small spider vein. And I don't think that's really cosmetic at that point. And you can actually fight with insurance usually to get them to pay for sclerotherapy. And then there's venous ablation, and the three top forms of venous ablation currently used in the United States are the RF, the laser, and foam ablation. Then uh, other things that we're thinking about as vascular surgeons is, do they have iliac crossing syndrome? Do they have pelvic congestion syndrome? Do we need to do a stent? If they have a history of chronic DVT, uh, you know, or they've had a, at least a couple DVTs, we're also thinking on the way to evaluate for iliac crossing syndrome, meaning during venogram, 
you could also do intravascular ultrasound, which has become a huge mainstay in the treatment of these patients at this point. Um, you can actually look throughout the entire vein and decide whether you want to angioplasty the entire deep system and into the iliac system. So I'm just going to show you some of these. These are the compression therapy devices. Um, that's the circade that I was talking about for the patients who are just uh, older. Of course, it's on that person. Clearly, she's not that old. Um, and then, then there's um, Jope's pumps, which there you can also send people for lymphedema massage where they do that. But I, I find this to be a little bit better only because the patient has control of it and they don't have to make an appointment all the time. This is the kind of person who I would argue sclerotherapy is not cosmetic because likely this person is going to bleed from a couple of sites. We obviously perform microphlebectomy for the tiny varicosities, but we try not to just do any sort of vein stripping nowadays. It's a rare, rare case where people should be do, doing vein stripping. Instead, we use venous ablation with either a laser, an RF catheter, or foam. Studies have c consistently, including this Rasmussen trial and a recent Cochrane review, have favored RF ablation. And the reason is because it, it, it leads to a faster return to work because of less pain, but it's just as e efficient or efficacious as a vein stripping. And that's just what this goes through too. Um, I did want to just really quick end with looking at venography and what I had said earlier about IVIS. Intravascular ultrasound has become a mainstay in these patients because when you shoot a venogram, a lot of the times the vein will look totally normal. If you look at A and B, they don't look really any different, but B has actually been stented. If you look at the ultrasound though, you can see that it's pancaked flat. And that's because imaging venography is a two-dimensional image. So when you shoot the picture, if something is flattened, you know, it's gonna look pretty big and it looks like it's normal. But when you get inside of it with intravascular ultrasound, all of a sudden that, that is actually not a large vessel. And then these are just some pictures of patients with coil embolization. Um, the, you know, again, it's not like venous disease it, when you intervene on these patients, it's not as, so to speak, like sexy as arterial. Cause you think like, oh, the artery is gonna, get the, if the person has an acute occlusion, they're gonna lose their leg, we're, we're saving the leg. But this is like a slow death. <laughs> That's the way I think of it for the patients is literally they're going through something horrible, especially if they're going to wound care every single week with debridements over and over. That's not an easy thing. And if you can change their life, it is actually very huge. There are multiple groups now looking at what is appropriate, just so you know. Um, so if you have patients, uh, the the SVS, the American Vein and Lymphatic Society, the Society of Vascular Surgery are all starting to list what they think is appropriate use for this because it is kind of like the wild, wild west. And it, it has to do with symptoms. Uh, this is detailed, but really, if a patient is, just has valves that don't work, but they have no symptoms, there's no reason to do anything, just so you know, when you're treating your patients. But if they have symptoms and they have issues, as the symptoms worsen and the condition worsens, that's the appropriate time to, to act. And that's it.